politically, uh, the, um, the Republican Party disintegrates in much of the South um, in the 1880s. Um, and Democratic legislatures, as happens nowadays, try their best to, you know, ensure their permanent hold on power. They gerrymander uh, districts in order to concentrate the black vote so that Republicans will only be able to elect a few members of the legislature. They make many offices appointive by the legislature, um, sheriffs, tax collectors, etc., rather than by local uh, African-American voters. These laws often apply only to black belt counties. The white in their counties can elect their local officials, but in the Afri predominantly African-American counties, the, the legislature will now uh, appoint them. Um, but you don't yet have a fully one-party South because there's all sorts of um, opposition parties, local or regional opposition parties pop up. The Greenback Party, I mentioned them before, in the late 1870s. The Readjusters, I mentioned them. Or what they just called independent candidates. In other words, dissident whites who didn't like the policies of the planter, merchant controlled uh, Democratic Party would run independent candidates, and inevitably those candidates would appeal for black votes. The only way you're going to win against the dominant Democratic Party is by somehow creating a coalition of dissident Democrats and African American voters. Occasionally, as I said before, they actually win control of, of certain states, and often they pose a threat to Democratic rule. By, in the 1880s, these opposition candidates, which went under different names, uh, typically got 30 to 40 percent of the vote in many southern states, and sometimes uh, even more than that. Why didn't, why, why didn't these southern states then just disenfranchise the black voters right away? And the reason is they were still nervous about the possibility of federal intervention. We know that 1877 is the end of Reconstruction, but they didn't know that. And there was always talk in the 1880s by Northern Republicans of enforcing the 15th Amendment, enforcing the 14th Amendment. And in a sense, the real, the real turning point came in the 1890s. Um, number one, the, in 1889, the, in, the, in the early 1889, for one of the few times um, in that whole period, Republicans found themselves in control of both the presidency and the Congress. And Senator Lodge of Mississippi, uh, sorry, Mississippi, Massachusetts, wrong place. <laughs> Senator Lodge of Massachusetts introduced what he called the Lodge Bill or the, an enforcement bill, or as it was called by their opponents, the Force Act, to, like the Ku Klux Klan Acts 20 years before almost, to try to use federal power to guarantee the right to vote in the South. In other words, to enforce the 15th Amendment. To prevent violence, preventing people from voting, to, use, to prevent some of these other methods that were preventing people from voting. It failed in the Senate, even though Republicans had a majority. And this was sort of taken as another <laughs> indication, or the final indication, that Southerners had nothing to fear from um, federal intervention. And it's the following year, 1890, that Mississippi, in its constitutional convention, begins the process in the South of simply eliminating black voting, disenfranchising African American men from voting. Um, how do they do this? The 15th Amendment is still on the books. You cannot just pass a law saying only white people can vote, as you had before the Civil War. This, the 15th Amendment specifically says People cannot be deprived of the right to vote because of race. So, but as we have said, the 15th Amendment opened up, or at least allowed for, many other ways of limiting the right to vote. And in Mississippi and then every other southern state between 1890 and I think maybe Georgia, 1906 was the last one, um, adopted a, a series of measures to eliminate the black vote. For example, the poll tax, where you have to pay a dollar, two dollars, in order to vote. It had to be paid in advance, months in advance, long before you even knew who was running. And it became cumulative. If you didn't pay one year, the next year you had to pay back poll tax. 
to know that poorer people simply could not, could not meet that. Um, the literacy test, literacy tests were introduced since large part of the black population was still illiterate. Various kinds of residency requirements and particularly what they called the understanding clauses. Understanding, where you had to demonstrate to the registrar your understanding of the state constitution, the federal constitution. This was like an interview to allow you to register to vote. And if you didn't answer the questions properly, you simply were not allowed to vote. Um, I brought along here, this is a copy of the Alabama uh, test. Uh, this lasted all the way down to the 1960s and was one of the reasons why the Voting Rights Act was passed. But it's a, it's a series of like 68 questions on the U.S. Constitution, um, which you could ask any number of if you're the registrar. For example, I don't even know. I, by the way, I would fail this test. <laughs> the Constitution limits the size of the District of Columbia to what? I don't know. If the election of the president becomes the duty of the House of Representatives and it fails to act, who becomes president and when? Uh, on and on. You see, the point is that it left it completely to the discretion of the registrar. If a white guy comes into registrar, he just says, uh, we got two officials, the president and who's next to him? The guy says, vice president. All right, you understand the, the Constitution, you vote. African Americans come in, they're given these questions which are impossible to answer. And so, unlike the poll tax, which will affect all poor people, the literacy and uh, particularly the understanding clause is, is at the discretion of the registrar and is used in a blatantly um, discriminatory manner. Now, what is going on in the South in the 1890s as this disenfranchised movement, disenfranchisement movement gathers force. It is the rise and eventually fall of the populists, the largest by far of these insurgent movements. The populist party, which existed in the West as well as the South, a kind of an uprising considering against the great poverty that was afflicting farmers uh, in the entire country. Um, in the South, is some, I don't want to over-romanticize them because uh, some historians do that, but it is certainly the case that some populist leaders made the calculation that they must appeal to black voters in order to, in order to win. They talked about a, an interracial class-based alliance of poor farmers, white and black, both suffering from the same problem, the decline of the price of cotton, which, by the way, by this point is at five cents a pound, which is, you cannot make a living at five cents a pound. You lose, every cotton farmer in the South is losing money as the price of cotton declines on the world uh, market. But also the credit system we talked about, the crop lien, indebtedness, railroad rates. The populace put forward a very radical set of proposals, government ownership of the railroads, government providing credit, in other words, making loans directly to farmers, cutting out the bankers, cutting out the merchants, and many other things. Tom Watson of Georgia was sort of the classic populist attempting to bring black and white small farmers together in, a, um, in an interracial alliance. 